Last weekend, we wrapped up our series in Matthew chapter 11 called Good in All Time. This week, we're going to move on to chapter 12. And now at the beginning of chapter 11, it started with John the Baptist sending messengers to Jesus and saying like, hey, are you the guy? Because we had this picture and John was talking about, oh, he's going to come and he's going to baptize with fire. And Jesus comes and he lets John baptize him and then he's just kind of healing people. He's not hanging out with the people you really need to hang out with to get this revolution started that John the Baptist thinks is coming. And so, are, you know, are you the guy? Are you that baptizer with fire? And Jesus assures them, yes, tell them what you've seen, what I've done. Yes, I'm him. But then he also, we'll see here in chapter 12, starts sort of, we, we get a little more of a picture of that, bapti- that baptizer with fire here. Uh, there's a lot of controversy in this chapter. There's a lot of clashing that Jesus is going to do with especially the Pharisees. And before, we've seen in Matthew where he'll clash with the Pharisees and, you know, they just kind of walk away and they're like, I don't, I don't think I like that guy. Now they start making plans. You don't want the Pharisees making plans about you. Now they're making plans. And so we've called this series The Boss because we learn a lot about Jesus here. You've probably heard the titles Lord of Lord, King of Kings. Right? What does that mean? It means Jesus is supreme over everything. He is the king that all other kings bow to. He is the Lord that all other lords submit to. You could say he's the ultimate answer to the Danza question. Who's the boss? <laughs> Jesus says. That's what he is. That's how he wants to be seen. Maybe you've got a boss you just like absolutely can't stand. You and Sean can commiserate after service. Uh, But (laughs) Jesus is going to paint a new picture here for us of what it looks like to be the boss. We're going to see Jesus as supreme in chapter 12, and we're going to also see what leadership looks like. What does it look like to lead people? Because Jesus models that for us here as well. So let's jump right into our passage, Matthew chapter 12, right in verse 1. It says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Now I want to pause there because it sounds like Jesus' disciples are just stealing grain from people, right? (laughs) They're just walking through someone else's field and they're like, hmm, like you can't, we can't do that, right? Like, you can't just go, like, try that at the supermarket. Just, like, open up some Triscuits and just gnaw, gnaw down. Like, you're going to get kicked out of the store, right? But what's interesting is there's actually laws in Deuteronomy about this sort of thing. In Deuteronomy 23, it says, If you go into a neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So basically, it's God's way of telling his people, look, don't be stingy. Don't be so tight and so focused on all the details. Like, it's all right. Somebody takes a grape or two. That's cool. But it does sort of protect them at the same time. It says, but don't put any grapes in your bag. It's kind of like if you go to a buffet, you're not allowed to take a doggy bag home, right? Because <laughs> then you just fill up a plate, put it in the box, and you got another free meal on them out of this buffet situation. And so he's saying, look, don't just go there and grab grapes, put them in your bag. Don't bring a sickle with you. You want to pluck some grain? Cool. Don't go start just harvesting your neighbor's stuff. And so you'll see other places in the law where you're not supposed to harvest all the way to the edges to allow this to happen. You're not supposed to pick up anything you drop while you're harvesting. You're supposed to leave it for the gleaners. There are ways that we see the character of God through the law. That's why it's still a good thing for us to read today. So when the disciples are picking some grain and they're eating it, the problem here that's going to arise isn't going to be the food. But I'll let the Pharisees show up and we'll take it from there. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him, how he entered the, presence, entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence 
which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they said to him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and pull it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him, so that they may destroy him. And so the whole thing starts because Jesus' disciples are picking grain. Not that they're picking grain, but that they're doing it on the Sabbath. And then Jesus heals someone on the Sabbath. Well, I guess the first question that I don't want to assume everyone knows the answer to here is, well, what is the Sabbath, right? What's going on here? Well, Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. It's the idea that in Genesis chapter 1, we see God creates everything in six days, and then he takes a seventh day to rest. And so that becomes this rhythm that God institutes for Israel in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your female servant, or your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so he's saying because of this pattern that God set in creation, institute that as a people group. And so you work for six days, you rest on the seventh day. And so you see God's character again here, right? Because he's instituting, he's mandating a day off. That's a great commandment to get, right? <laughs> like, hey, you just have to sit home and do nothing. Like, all right, I can do that. <laughs> I'm pretty good at that. And so they get this command, and then you see God's character because he also says, look, not just you, but your kids. Don't put your kids to work. Like, that's not what this is about. Don't even work your animals. You have foreigners among you that aren't even Jews that don't even worship me. Don't make them work for you either. Like, I've never understood, like, I've lived at different times near Amish communities, how, like, they won't use electricity, but they'll let other people use it for them. Like, you see them pile out of a van, but not one of them isn't driving. It's like, how does that work? Like, well, he can go to hell and drive me wherever I'm going. I don't care. Like, I, don't, I don't understand. It doesn't seem right. Maybe that's just me. So what God says here, everything's supposed to shut down on the Sabbath so that they have rest. It's a blessed day. It's a day set aside for the Lord. That's what holy means. It's a day to rest. God commands this to them, not as a burden, but Sabbath is a gift. He orders a day off. And so they took Sabbath very seriously. It was very important to them. Actually, later in Genesis, you see the death penalty is instituted for someone that breaks Sabbath. It's important to God. It's important to them that they take it. But it was also a signal to the people around them. In Exodus 31, it says, It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that, the, that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And so it's a sign forever. Well, who is it a sign to? Well, it's a sign between them, but it's also a sign to everybody around them. There were three external signs that Israel sort of had that made them unique. The first was circumcision, the second was their dietary laws, and the third was Sabbath. But Sabbath was the only one that was exclusive to Israel because some other people groups did something like circumcision, other people groups had temples and offered sacrifices, others had special diets that they went on. But Israel was the only one that had Sabbath. That's what made them unique, that's what made them distinct. 
And so Sabbath was so important to them that they wouldn't even defend their cities on the Sabbath. If you just happened to bring your army on a Saturday, they would just let you overrun them. They wouldn't even defend themselves. And you can see that at different times in history popping up. And so it's not long before Jesus is born that they start getting down to like the nitty-gritty of, well, what does it really mean? Like, What are the exact things that you shouldn't do on the Sabbath? There's an entire chapter of the oral law that is dedicated to the things that you should not do on Sabbath. There are 39 things on the list. Would you like to hear them? <laughs> Sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves. That's when you grab like a stack of something and tie it up. Threshing, that's when you separate the grain from the plant. Winnowing, that's when you blow air through the grain to remove the chaff. Sorting crops, grinding crops, sifting crops, kneading, baking, shearing, washing fabric, beating fabric, dyeing fabric, spinning, weaving, making two loops, <laughs> weaving, <laughs> weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying, untying, sewing two stitches, tearing two stitches, trapping, slaughtering, flaying, preserving meat, curing hides, scraping dead animals, butchering, writing, erasing writing, building, demolishing, putting out a fire, kindling a fire, hitting with a hammer, or my favorite, number 39, transporting an object from one place to another. <laughs> and that's not even exhaustive, because I can already think of a couple things that don't make this list that they get upset about with Jesus. And I've also, I often, often will mention the walking restriction they had, right? And the law, it says, don't walk a mile on the Sabbath. Well, they come in and go, don't walk a half mile on the Sabbath. So even if you break that, you're still so far away from possibly breaking the law. And so the major beef that the Pharisees have here with Jesus is that his disciples seem to be running afoul of the Ten Commandments. They're violating the Sabbath laws. And this isn't one of the obscure laws. Or it's one of the Ten Commandments. Like, if anything... You guys should know the Ten Commandments. They're the Big Ten, right? You should know this. And so what you see here in this passage is that the Pharisees have just completely lost sight of who God is. That's what Jesus exposes in them here. And all their striving to follow him diligently, they work so hard to get the how right that they completely forget about the why they're focused on the how, they miss the why. They're so narrow-minded that they miss this completely. I think the first problem is they don't remember what the Sabbath is even for. It's probably no coincidence that this story comes right after Jesus says, like we talked about last week, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and take that upon me. They just build rules on top of rules on top of rules, and it's hard for people to keep track. But the Pharisees are lawyers, so they're into that thing. And they love picking apart every word and making sure it's exactly, this is what we should do, this is what we shouldn't do, and so on. And I'm not saying be careless about it, but they take scrupulous to this whole different level here. They're just drilling down on everything. And now Jesus doesn't come in, certainly, with like the Outback slogan, no rules, just right. Like that's not his approach at all. He shows us what holiness looks like. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says lust is the same thing as adultery. He raises resentment, says don't just kill people, but you're guilty if you even resent someone. The resentment is not the same thing as murder, but it's also wrong. In Jesus, we see who God is, though. So we see his mercy and grace. We see his compassion on display. And those are things that the Pharisees have missed completely. So they ask Jesus, is it lawful for them to be picking grain and eating it? Which is basically this question. Is it biblical what they're doing right now? Is it biblical for them to be picking grain and eating it? They're asking Jesus, the capital W Word of God, if what he's allowing his disciples to do is biblical. That's rich, right? <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. You got a feel for him at some point, the Pharisees, like, guys, oh, man, how did you... 
like I'm just, I'm embarrassed for them, right? Like if you've ever seen a botched wedding proposal, you know this feeling, right? Where like he gets down and her eyes get the wrong kind of big and you're just like, oh no, this is not going well. <laughs> you just like, you feel embarrassed watching it happen. It's what kind of how I feel for the Pharisees. Like you really ask Jesus, is this biblical what you're doing right here? Like, oh no, guys. And so now that I've given you that good list of 39 things that are wrong on the Sabbath, and I think I can pinpoint what they're specifically going after here. Number one, plucking the grain. That's reaping. It's on the list. Rubbing to get it away from the husk. Threshing. You blow the husk away, so you just have the grain left. Well, that's winnowing, of course. And you could probably argue the entire thing is the preparation of food, which is also banned. And so what does Jesus do? How does he answer something like this? Is it biblical, what you guys are doing? What's he do? He drives them right back to the Bible. Have you not read? <laughs> Which this is like, now we get sassy Jesus. And I love sassy Jesus. <laughs> like, have you not read? Have you guys, did you guys not study this? All right, well, let me, let me tell you about this. He says read because, of course, they read. They're Pharisees. These guys are the lawyers. They're the legal religious experts of the day. Whenever Jesus talks to crowds, he always says, have you not heard? Because a lot of them couldn't read. But he knows these guys can read for themselves. And it's like, oh, did you guys not read this story? Oh, well, let me, let me tell you some things about the law. I mean... The Phar they're Pharisees. You don't get to that position without knowing the law front to back. Some of them had it literally memorized, the entire Torah. He goes, oh, you guys didn't read this part. And so his first argument is this episode that happens with David's hungry men. So David is fleeing Saul, and he's got this band of uh, army men with him. And they're hungry, and they reach the tabernacle, and David walks in and is just kind of like... You guys got anything to eat? We're starving. And this is the story here. Oh, actually, no, this is not the story. That's a different verse. Never mind. But, and so David goes, you guys got anything to eat? And what the priest tells him is the only thing we have is the bread of the presence. And so this is what I was about to, what this next slide is. The explanation for what is this bread that they're saying yeah, this is what we've got. In Leviticus 24, it says, You shall take fine flour and bake twelve loaves from it. Two-tenths of an ephah shall be in each loaf. You shall set them in two piles, six in a pile, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. You shall put pure frankincense on each pile, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion. It's a food offering to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. Now, here's the important part. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, those are the priests, and they shall eat it in a holy place, which only the priests are allowed to go to, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offerings, a perpetual due. So only the priests are supposed to eat this bread, and they are only supposed to go into the holy place to eat this. David, not a priest. So he's not even supposed to go in there, and then he's definitely not supposed to take the bread and eat it. But what does David do? They tell him, all we got is this. And so he goes, all right. And he goes into the holy place, grabs the bread, and him and his men chow down. And so the priest stops him and is like, have you guys stayed holy? And he's like, yeah, especially today, trust me. We've been holy. He goes, all right, go, go ahead. And the priest lets this happen. And so Jesus is making this argument. It's called the less and the weighty, where it's like, okay, if that's true of David, then how much more true is it of the son of David? Like, you go from the less to the greater. So, like, I'm, you know, I'm all right in the kitchen. I'm not great with my knife skills, so maybe it takes me, like, five minutes to dice an onion. And so how much quicker would it take, like, a five-star chef to dice an onion? they do it much faster than me. For my shoulder surgery, I could probably throw a baseball, like, 50, 60 miles an hour. How much faster could an MLB pitcher throw the baseball. That's the way the argument works. And so Jesus is saying, look, David's this forerunner of the Messiah. He's this type of the Messiah that's come long before. And if he's able to do this, if he's able to skirt 
Sabbath laws and temple laws, then how much more is the actual Messiah able to do that? Pharisees aren't going to like this answer. So if it's true for David, of course it's true for Jesus. But then he gives a different example. He goes, everybody keeps the Sabbath, right? Have you ever noticed that the priests don't? Right? As a pastor, I relate here. Sunday is not a very restful day for me, <laughs> right? And so it's a pretty exhausting one. I've heard people refer to that as sort of the holy hangover Sunday afternoon. And so Jesus makes this point pretty forcefully. He's like, look, the priests do all kinds of work on the Sabbath. He says they profane the Sabbath. This is incredibly strong language. They profane it. They desecrate it. They stomp all over the Sabbath. No one's supposed to do any work on that day, but look at the priests. Look how much work they do. You never thought about that? And he goes, so if that's true for the priest of the temple, how much more true is that for something greater than the temple itself? And so Jesus is showing himself as supreme. He's above everything, above David, above the temple. We're getting back to him claiming to be God in ways the Pharisees understood, and it sends them away seething mad. And so they miss it. The Pharisees miss it because they forget what Sabbath's for that it's a gift to them. But they also miss it by under, misunderstanding what God wants. They think God is more honored by them obeying a checklist than by them being merciful and generous. And so Jesus has to set them straight here. He gives them a different passage. He sends them to Hosea 6, chapter 6. God wants mercy over sacrifice. That means the way you treat people is more important than following all of the rules. So they go into the synagogue, and there's this man there that needs healing. And the Pharisees are just kind of sitting there wondering, like, okay, what's this Jesus guy going to do? Now, it had been decided that life-threatening sicknesses were the only ones that should be dealt with on the Sabbath. Anything else that can wait a day. I was curious uh, what this looked like today. Uh, and my sister spent a good deal of time in an Israeli hospital. Uh, and so I was like, hey, what did they do like on Saturday? And she was like, oh, from like sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, they just basically run a skeleton crew. You can't get any big tests done. Oh, interesting. Now you know. Uh, <laughs> but back to our text here, the answer for the Pharisees is that they wanted Jesus to say to this guy, hey, man, I'm really sorry, but it's Sabbath, and I know you got the hand thing. If we could just wait until like sundown, then maybe I can come back, or you can come find me, and we can make this whole healing thing happen, because surely this isn't threatening his life. But it's cold. It's, there's this coldness to it that isn't what we see in Jesus. It's not what we see in God at all. The Pharisees had this view, like, no, well, don't help that person. There was even one school of Pharisees that said, look, don't even go visit the sick on Saturday. Thankfully, that's a minority opinion. But there was this coldness to their obedience. They were clinging to this list of rules, and they were missing what God would want in that situation. He's not impressed by sacrifice. He wants mercy. He wants them to show mercy to the people that need it. That's what would please the Lord, and they don't see it. And so they ask Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Is it biblical to heal on the Sabbath? How Jesus goes without losing his mind? I have no idea. And so Jesus gives them an example. Like, look, you got one sheep. It falls into a pit. You're going to pull the sheep out of the pit, right? You're not just going to be like, hey, sorry, sheep. <laughs> I'll come back for you. Like, <laughs> that's not what you're getting. You're going to reach in. You're going to grab that sheep. You're going to pull them out. And so if it's true for a sheep, how much more true for it is a man who's created in God's image? Why wouldn't you help him? They've lost their ways. They're missing the forest for the trees. So if you're driving to church and the car in front of you hits a deer, what do you do? The Pharisees would say, well, you just kind of go around and go, oh, man, that's terrible. Well, we'll fill out a prayer request for him when we get there. <laughs> you can't miss church, surely. 
Jesus is going, forget about church. You'll get there next week. Stop and help those people. Mercy over sacrifice. And so Jesus blasts them again here. So it is lawful to do what is good on the Sabbath, which doesn't really give you the feel, right? That doesn't really, it sounds a little rote. Let's recontextualize that statement. Jesus goes, don't worry, guys. It's biblical to do the right thing on the Sabbath. Boom. I wish I had a mic up here so I could just drop it. <laughs> don't worry. It's okay. I know you're wondering, is it okay? If, if, would God be pleased if we did the right thing on the Sabbath today? Don't worry. It is. It's not a problem. I know they didn't have sunglasses back then, but I picture Jesus like putting them on in a cool way after that. And so then what does he do? Like, don't worry, guys. It's cool. You can do the right thing on the Sabbath. And then he does this amazing miracle. This guy's got this paralyzed hand. And Jesus goes, stretch it out. And he stretches it out, and it just goes. And it's restored, and it's the same as the other hand. He gives this amazing gift of grace and mercy to this guy at the synagogue who needs it. Who is this Jesus that can do this with just a word? And what kills me is how the Pharisees miss this so badly here. Like the grain thing I can kind of understand. They're being a little pedantic. They've got this hall monitor persona going on. But I can kind of understand where they're coming from. Right? Like I don't go around trying to catch people in sin and give them a hard time for it. But hey, if you see something, say something. All right, I get it. But where they really blow it is with this healing. Because notice this, they expect Jesus to be able to heal this guy, right? The whole story doesn't hold up unless they expect that he can do this. And they're like, wonder if this guy that just does the craziest miracles we've ever seen, wonder if he's going to do one today on Saturday. <laughs> what? How do you miss that? None of them go, wait a second, if he can do all this, are we sure this isn't the guy? <laughs> None of them do. And then even if they didn't really expect that they could do it, they just thought he was going to try, they're just asking this general question, opportunity arises, just, hey, is it lawful to do this? Even if that's true, their reaction to this miracle is so warped. Jesus tells this guy, paralyzed hand, stretch it out. It's restored. It looks just like the other one. He's made fully whole again. And the Pharisees see that and go, he shouldn't have done this life-giving miracle on Saturday. Let's kill him. <laughs> what? They're missing that the whole point of the Sabbath is health. And here Jesus restores someone's health on the Sabbath. Sabbath is for mercy, and here Jesus gives mercy to this person. And they miss it completely. They see what Jesus does, and they think he's the problem here? The Pharisees weren't having it, and so they start getting into their schemes, and they start ramping them up. And from now on in the book of Matthew, as we go through, we'll start seeing them plot and scheme ways to take Jesus out. And so we got the story of the Sabbath. And so I'd like to talk a little bit here about what Sabbath means for us now. Because we saw where it came from in the Old Testament. We saw where, how Jesus sort of interacts with it. But it's not the last time we see it in the New Testament. And in Colossians, Paul writes this about it. He says, And you... Who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on what on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. 
These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And so in the first paragraph there, we see Paul's talking about how Jesus has taken away all of our sins. And this is one of the passages that describes this in legal detail. We had this record of debt, our sin. This is our criminal record. Instead of handing it over to the judge, Jesus nails it to the cross, and it doesn't stand against us anymore. He disarms everything that would stand between us and the Father. Everything that would put us to shame, he puts it to shame. And then Paul says, therefore, and whenever you see therefore in the Bible, it should always make you wonder, well, what is it there for? And so because Jesus has done this, Paul says, don't let anyone exclude you from the family of God because of what you eat or drink or what you don't eat or don't drink. Paul says, more relevant to today's passage, because Jesus has done this for you, don't let anyone exclude you from God's family because you don't celebrate the same holidays or festivals or Sabbaths. So Paul's saying these things aren't the real thing. The real thing is Jesus. These are his shadow. They sort of show us that he's coming, but they weren't the real thing. There were signs that pointed to him. They weren't him. And so Sabbath isn't something that we are forced to do as Christians. If you don't take a Sabbath, your salvation is not in jeopardy. It doesn't make you a bad Christian, but I will say this, you're missing out. When I worked in D.C., I played pretty fast and loose with uh, Sabbath, and I overworked myself to the brink. Didn't just burn out. I managed to like burn out, and then somehow the ashes caught fire too. Um, uh, and thankfully, nothing dramatic happened. I didn't have any meltdowns. or uh, I did have some weeks of migraines where I'd have one every day. Ah, the times when a week of migraines was the worst thing that I had to look forward to. Uh, well, I suppose one dramatic thing in all of this did happen. Um, I met this cute little red-haired girl, and I started making time for her. <laughs> and that just naturally made me... Uh, it was a bit of a wake-up call that I had a problem on my hands that I needed to fix. And so by holding myself to a personal Sabbath where I did no work, I was healthier for it. I was healthy, healthier mentally, healthier physically by doing that. It saves us from burnout. So when I talk about Sabbath as a Christian, it's not about following rules. It's sort of a non-legalistic day of rest. You have a day to just be, be energized, and refreshed, and maybe you're energized and refreshed by a long bike ride. Or somebody else would feel like you're torturing them to do that. Well, if that's you, ride the bike, man. That's cool. Make it a day where you're doing things that energize and refresh you, and make it a day where you especially remember the Lord. If you're not serving that week in one of our ministry teams here, man, Sunday's a pretty good day for that. Take this service with you. Think about it. Talk about it. Do things throughout your day that you find easy to worship in while you're doing. So I think Sabbath, it's not a requirement, but it is a gift to us today and for four reasons. The first is this. It goes against our culture in a positive way. It reminds us that what we do is not who we are. It reminds us that we are human beings, not human doings. And I know that everybody is so busy all the time. It's like a competition to who can be busier. Like, oh, I'm just so busy this month. I just can't squeeze it. Well, I'm so busy too. We're all just so busy. Look, everybody's busy. I get it. But you put a break in all of that chaos, and it's good for you. Number two, it serves as a reminder to who we belong to. You take a Sabbath, and that's a practical weekly reminder to us that we belong to Jesus. We point directly to him by the way we use our time. Our Sabbath gives us a weekly touch point with the gospel. Three, it's good stewardship. Resting your mind and your body does a great deal for your physical, mental, and emotional health. It's playoff season for the NBA. My Cavs have been just blowing teams out and sweeping them 
And the big story has been how much rest they're getting and how good that has been for them. They've got nine days in between their last series and the series that they'll play in the next one. And it's the hot topic in all the NBA like sphere now is the teams that rest more play better. I think when we rest more, we perform better. So when we rest our body and our mind, we're stewarding them well. We're taking what God has given us and doing a good job with it. And I think number four, it's a statement of faith. And when we tithe, we're saying, I trust you, Lord, that you can do more with 90% of my money than I can do with 100% of it. And when we Sabbath, we say, God, I trust that you can do more with six days than I can do with seven. And so that's sort of how I think Sabbath relates to us now. But at the end here, we're going to land on what's most important in this passage is Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord over everything, no matter how sacred. He's not just excusing the disciples. He puts himself above everything, above David, above the temple, above the Torah. Everything sacred, he's worth more than that. Anything you can think of, he's more lovely than that. He's above everything. He is more valuable and he is supreme. He is Lord, and that means whatever he wants to do, he does. He's sovereign. That means that he's the only one that gets to decide what's important. The lesson to take from this passage is not like, oh, well, we can just take these things that we don't want to do and just chuck them out of here. <laughs> like That's not what Jesus is doing here. He's Jesus. Thomas Jefferson is sort of famous for a version of the Gospels that he had put together where he literally cut out every time Jesus did a miracle because he was like, oh, miracles can't happen, and just cut them literally out of the Bible. And so you just get... All of the stories where Jesus does everything non-miraculous. He's like, this is probably the more historically accurate one. You're like, no, oh. <laughs> you missed it completely. But we do the same thing sometimes where we'll know, like, okay, this is how Jesus wants us to treat people, or this is the way that it should look uh, as we live as Christians, and we go, eh, I don't really want to do that, so I'm just going to pretend it's not there. And so we've got to follow Jesus' lead because he's Lord, and he gets to decide what's important. Truly worshiping Jesus means beholding him as all wonderful, all worthy. And so we see by his example here that what marks the people of God is not how well they are disciplined, but by how well they love other people. The Pharisees got this backwards. They rush to condemn people. And we see where that gets them. That's not the way Jesus acts. That's not the way his followers should behave. So think about the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, we've got the fruit of the Spirit. 5.22 it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, this is Paul writing, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are supposed to be the outward signs of a life transformed by the gospel. You notice anything about that grouping? There's nine of them up there. Eight of them are about the way you treat other people and are primarily external, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. That's all about the way you treat others. It's all external. There's only one up there that is about you, internal, primarily, and that's self-control. Now, it's up there, so I'm not saying like, oh, well, we can just toss it out. No, it's on the list, so it's important. But I think it's telling that love, joy, peace, these are the things that Jesus says. These should be the markers. Jesus tells the disciples, the way you love each other, that's going to be the best signal to the world that you are mine. It's the way you treat each other, the way you love each other. Sabbath was the one thing that made the people of Israel distinct. Jesus is the one thing that makes us, dis us distinct. And when it, wherever he goes, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control go with him. And so lastly, much like last week, what we see here is that it's in Jesus and only in Jesus that we truly find rest. A day off will help your body. It'll help your mind. 
But when we put our trust and we rest in the finished work of Jesus, it helps unimaginably more. And so we experience that in part now as we follow him. But one day, if we put our trust in him, if we put our faith in Jesus, that he was the son of God that lived and died and rose again. And just like we read Paul say, he took that sin from us, took it away, nailed it to the cross. God takes our sin and just tosses it into the abyss. He doesn't remember it anymore. I don't even know what you're talking about. He looks at us when we're in Jesus and loves us unimaginably more than we could ever think. And all it takes is we come to Him, to this Jesus, this Lord of the Sabbath, we make Him Lord also of our lives and allow Him to take over. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that You are sovereign, that You are in control, that You are Lord over anything and everything, that we can trust and rest in You. That when You said it was finished, it was not just Your work that was finished, it was our work as well. Lord, help us to trust and depend and rely on You and Your grace and Your mercy. Lord, give us faith. In Jesus' name, amen.